Hello and welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Aaron Klein, CEO of Riskalyze. Riskalyze is a risk tolerance assessment and illustration tool that helps advisors better communicate risk in portfolios, which helps advisors better communicate with clients about risk in their portfolios and expectations. And with that, here's my interview with Aaron. Hello, Aaron. Hey, great to be with you. Yeah, it's great for you to make time from uh, sunny Sacramento, California. <laughs> Happy. It's a little cloudy today, but you know we've got no excuses being in California. Yes, well, I'm in Toronto, <laughs> and it's still kind of <laughs> winter, so we can go from there. So Aaron Klein of Riskalyze, tell us about Riskalyze. Yeah, you know, um, we started the company back in 2001 around the idea that investing just felt really broken to the average individual. I remember saying to my co-founder back then, way back then, um, it is crazy how the average individual thinks about the concept of risk. And he said, if you think that's crazy, you should see how many of us financial advisors think about it. You know, we just don't have the tools to really understand and think about and talk about risk with our clients effectively and to uh, create the kind of alignment that we really need to help clients make the right decisions. Well, those are the uh, better advisors are actually stopping to think about risk because <laughs> unfortunately, true. the majority from, from polls really don't understand it themselves at all. That's, so. that's a great point. That's a yeah. great point. So um, we just kind of looked at that and said, we think that there's a lot of opportunity there to really transform the investing experience for the individual because I think Warren Buffett said it best, like investments are literally the only thing that the consumer refuses to buy when they're at their cheapest and only wants to buy when they're at their most expensive, yeah, right? The old, the old uh, hamburgers on sale conversation. <laughs> that's right. You're we absolutely right. right. The rising price of investments as success, and that's when we want to buy and put on more risk and yeah. put more money in our accounts. And then we equate you know, dropping prices with failure and and bad. And so that's when we want to take money out and take risk off. And ultimately, it just doesn't work. It's, it's buy high, sell low, repeat for 30 years until you're broke. So we just said, look, I, I, there's got to be a way to better understand who people are as individuals. And you know, we kind of stepped back and said, I think that financial advice has gone through a series of waves. So like the first wave was returns focused advice, right? These were just salespeople. We called them brokers. They would sell stocks, then they would sell mutual funds. And and that's how we started the whole way that people got invested is we would sell products, right? And, and it was kind of a returns focused pitch. Like we've got a better research team. I've got access to investments you can't get access to. I deliver better returns. I'm better at picking stocks, like all those different pitches and which were unsustainable in the first place, but yes, exactly right. Right. So, you know, I I like to put it this way. The pitch was my mutual fund is better than the other guy's mutual fund. And then what led to the second wave was the reality set in. And we said, huh, my mutual fund is not actually any better than the other guy's mutual fund. Right. So the second wave is what I would call goals based investing. So that's where, you know, what we're going to do instead is we're going to take the amount of money you have. We're going to run it through long-term analysis. And we're going to say, don't worry, you're going to be able to make your goals. In fact, when you ask me about short-term returns, I'm going to deflect the question. I'm going to say you shouldn't be thinking about short-term returns. You should stop opening your mail, try not to watch television, just be a long-term investor. Yep. And there's obviously some good nuggets of truth to that advice, right? Because Fidelity did that study about, you know, like what, what are the factors that lead people with self-directed brokerage accounts to have like the hub to be in the highest performing 5%. Yep. And they found three factors, right? Like if you had one of these three factors, it was a high probability you were going to be in the top 5% of performers of a Fidelity self-directed brokerage account. And yep. the three factors were you had lost your password, right? Yep. You had completely forgotten you had an account at Fidelity or yep. you had died. Like yep. those were the three factors, right? That's my favorite study ever. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, we are really good at sabotaging how we invest. And so there are nuggets of truth to that advice of don't open your mail, try not to watch television, just be a long-term investor. But the problem with that advice is that the vast majority of humans are completely incapable of following it. Like that's the problem. You have to be a sociopath to be able to follow that without any emotion, right? Because exactly. essentially, this is an emotional roller coaster, right? No one, everybody's loss averse, right? At least so, yep. because no one, you work hard for your money, you don't want to see it disappear. Yep. And no one wants to fear missing out on the next big thing. And you have to, it's basically, I think, remember, there was, um, there was another study once that was done that showed that people who had suffered brain damage actually were better investors on the whole. <laughs> I love that. It's great. All of that is why we believe that the third wave 
is risk-centric advice, where you actually put, you know, I've heard financial advisors say there are two things you should never talk about with your clients. And it's not religion and politics, right? It's, it's risk and the short term. And they go, I need my clients to be long-term investors. I never want to talk about the short term and the short term, t- you know, timeframes with them. And I never want to talk about risk with them. I don't want to, I just want them to like stay focused on their goals. And so those are the two things we never talk about with clients. And I think that you've got to flip that. Like we really felt that the core of this was flipping that and putting risk at the center of how we talk about this because investors react to risk in the short term. And if you can build the investor a short-term framework to understand and react to risk appropriately, that's how you take a fear-bound investor who makes bad short-term decisions and you turn them into a fearless investor who makes really great short-term decisions and great short-term decisions are the fuel, the foundation that amazing advisors use to create long-term financial outcomes. And that's, that is the core of, of who we are and why we started the company. Our mission is empowering the world to invest fearlessly. And uh, we're really excited to be on this journey. And here we are. I mean, it's, it's kind of been crazy, but here we are. We launched the product six years ago. We had four people in the company at that point in time, uh, brought it out of beta and today we serve well over 20,000 financial advisors and have about 200 risk advisors across the country serving those advisors. Well, you know, it's, and I, I, I'm complete alignment with everything you're saying. I mean, um, in my own practice, sometimes clients accuse me in the investment meeting of, of depressing them when I showed them the portfolio. <laughs> Go into because the focus is always on okay, here's the historical range. You have to be able to stomach this kind of projected downside and this number of years before it breaks even. So you might be sitting here in five years' time not making a penny. And guess what? That is actually according to plan. So right. if you don't like that, that's not the right portfolio for you. And something's off with your questionnaire. And I often tell them that when they're like, Why are you depressing me with this? Are you supposed to make me money? It's like <laughs> the biggest risk that you face is not that the markets aren't going to make money in the long term, right? Like yep. that has not been, the, you know, over someone's lifetime, that's not been the biggest risk. The biggest risk is that the market bottoms out, you panic, you pull out, and you never experience the upside on the other side, right? We right. learned that just last December, yet again, right? Yep. Down 15, 15, uh, 15% roughly, and they came rip-roaring back. And anyone who panicked at the bottom is basically in tears right now. Absolutely. As well they should be. And it was very interesting for us. We found that from a business perspective, I hate to say this because it sounds awful, but but the reality is, is like we are swamped with advisors calling us when markets are down. (laughs) You you would think that that would be like really bad for business, right? But they're like, oh my gosh, I have to find a better way to talk about risk with my clients because they're not getting it. And they're flooding my phone lines. Yeah with requests to sell. And, and I know that it's the worst possible time for them to sell. And I've got to find a better way to get this point across to them. Yeah, and this mantra has failed them. If you can read that. that <laughs> I love it. I got, I got a log that I had custom stay built. Invested. It's the old keep calm, stay, carry on. But it says keep calm and stay invested. I love uh, it. Custom. So yeah. So unfortunately, it, keeping calm, you know, is just, it's, we're not wired for that. So, so oh. tell us about how your software solves for that and creates a better way. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, we, we, we started kind of down this path and thinking about this problem and ultimately invented something that we call the risk number. And it's a one to 99 scale. It looks a lot like a speed limit sign. And it, it really, I think, intuitively gets across the idea to the, to the client of portfolios that go fast and portfolios that go slow. And that, you know, it's, it's not to say there is nothing necessarily superior about driving your car 75 miles an hour or 25 miles an hour. And the same is true, you know, if you want to translate that to kilometers as well. Like, by the way, if we get to it, there's a very funny story about on my honeymoon in Canada and forgetting to translate between kilometers and miles, but, but maybe we'll get to that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so anyway, all that to be said, like, I think that investors just kind of intuitively grasp this and it's really interesting. So advisors will take clients through the process most of the time they start with an assessment, they're gonna find the client's risk number. So you know, they get to the end of that process and the client might say, okay, I'm a risk 45, and that means that over the next six months, and six months is a, is a relatively short time period, but we found, we did a bunch of studies on this, and people have a really hard time relating to their money even a full year from now. Three months was way too short. Six months just was about the right time where people could really relate. Like they know what their raise is. They know, you know, they kind of have a sense of what they're going to spend money on in the next six months and how they're thinking about that. They have their own set of thinking about what the long term looks like. And that's important to have into account. But it's really hard to relate to your money a year from now, much less 30 years from now. 
right? Which is interesting because when you look at most market corrections and duration of them, peak the trough, right? You're kind of in that ballpark, right? So it's <laughs> interesting enough, we're wired in the exact yeah. wrong time frame for panicking about market downturns. Exactly right. Exactly <laughs> right. So we, we basically like come out of that and we say, okay, well, if you're risk 45, that might mean that you're comfortable with, say, over the next six months, risking about 8% of your portfolio to gain maybe 12% in your portfolio. Like mm-hmm. that's kind of your 95% probability over the next six months. And so you're and using- By the way, we always do that in dollar amounts, not in percentages, right? Because critically important that I experience the idea of opening up that statement and seeing minus 8% in dollars. Yes. So that I can relate to that and go, yes, I can stomach that for the chance to make this much money over the next six months. Yeah. I mean, the small numbers seem fine until you put a dollar sign in front of them and they're not so small anymore, just like well, fees. Not only that, but I don't know about Canadians, but I'll tell you this, four out of three Americans are bad at math. Okay. So I, yeah. four out of three. Our standardized tests are a little bit better than yours, but I'm not, <laughs> we're not far off. Bro, I, I have heard people like million dollar portfolio. I've, I've heard people say, well, I could be comfortable with a 15% loss over six months, but that portfolio better never go below $900,000. I've literally heard people say it, right? It's so like <laughs> that math can be, people, so we, you've got to zero in on the dollar amounts. And so yes. once we've identified, okay, this person's a risk 45 and we validated that with their, with the dollar amounts relevant to them. I often say, by the way, Warren Buffett and I might have the same risk number. But you've got to do it with dollar amounts relevant to you, or it's not going to come out right. Like I, if I put Warren's investment amount in, I have no idea how it would come out because I can't relate to his money as I go through the process. Conversely, I can guarantee you that if Warren Buffett put my dollar amount into Riskalyze, it would be a risk 99 because he'd be like, well, this is a trivial amount of money. Risk, 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 yeah. risk, right? So it, it's critically important that we do it on dollar amounts that are relevant to the individual. And so the person is a 45. So now we're going to go and we're going to look at their investment portfolio. And first of all, a lot of advisors discover that the client is currently invested with their other advisor or their self-directed account or whatever it is at an 88, Okay. And it's very simple to show the client the misalignment between how they're invested right now and how they are telling you that they want to be invested, right? A little bit more work to do. Questionnaires can actually be a strategic and tactical advantage to advisors do the proper job. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Because you, we've called a few of those. We had a couple uh, advisors tell us about those and they're like, we call this the ACAT form moment. Like you should have that uh, really close to you and ready to go because yep. that client is ready to go. But that in itself is a powerful tool. But then I think you've also got to bring risk capacity into the into the question, right? Yeah. So how much risk do they actually need to take in order to reach their goals? And what I've found is, is that for a lot of clients, like it's almost interesting. It's almost like, I don't want to say this is like uh, the vast, vast, vast majority, but a substantial number of clients have a tolerance that pretty closely matches how much risk they actually need to take in order to reach their goals. But it's critical that the advisor like takes a look at that. And we, we think financial planning software is a great way to do that. We've also built kind of a 60-second version that's very simple of saying, is this client's risk number compatible with a basic retirement goal? So that's built into Riskalyze as well. And oftentimes, that's the jumping off point for doing real financial planning because a lot of times clients don't want to invest the time or the money or the effort into doing a real financial plan. So that can kind of sell them on that process because when they load it up into what we call retirement maps, just a quick 60-second calculation, they go, well, what about if we bought a house? Or what about if we sent Johnny to college, like how would that impact things? You're like, this is why we should do a financial plan. So once, once you've kind of brought that together, that's what gives the advisor the ability to say, here's the portfolio that I think we need to move into that aligns with your, both your risk tolerance and your risk capacity. And, you know, let's look at it this way, this portfolio, same kind of thing, six month range, this portfolio six months from today has a 95% probability of ending up between this dollar amount and that dollar amount. And, you know, there's 5% of the risk that we can't quantify for you. Those are 5% probability events. Those are your 2008s and whatnot. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, not, not possibility events. Probability, probability events. events. Like, they will happen. Yes. Okay? You have a probability of winning the lottery. It's exactly. Minute, but... <laughs> <laughs> Very minute. But, I mean, I would even go so far as to say a 5% probability event is, is highly probable at some point. Very true. So we look at that 95% range and we go, look – if your portfolio six months from today is anywhere between this minus eight to plus 12%, we're going to give each other a thumbs up and say, that would be totally normal behavior for this risk 45 portfolio. And we're going to let the long-term behavior of the markets get us where we want to be. And the other really cool thing that that gives the advisor is a way to flip on the stress test 
and say, now let's take a look at this in the context of 2008. Because, you know, I can guarantee you if the market's up 20% six months from today, you're going to come in and say, why did we only make 12 or 14? Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to open up the stress test and show you. See, the market is a risk 78. You're telling me you want to be a risk 45. A 45 is never going to be to 78 in yep. a year like, say, 2013. Never in a million years. But take a look at 2008 and look at the difference in what a risk 78 portfolio did down like, what, 32, 38%, down 38% yep. versus this risk 42 portfolio, risk 45 portfolio where it's going to end up. So really helps the client to understand the relationship between risk and reward. So they're not basically telling the advisor what they often say, which is, hey, I, I just want a very high reward portfolio with no risk. Yes. Well, yeah, we all want unicorns to, to drag right. us in carriages to work, but that's not going to happen. But so effectively, you didn't take them with the risk assessment questionnaire. You yeah. display the risk through essentially prospect theory, showing them essentially what their prospects are up or down. So good on you for using behavioral finance there. And then you also show projections for ranges over time, showing them that, hey, here's the realm of expectations, kind of a Monte Carlo of the entire, well, not so much a Monte Carlo, but a kind of a Monte Carlo <laughs> probability <laughs> calculation. Yeah. We actually use a different method, which of course I'm going to blank on the name, but Monte Carlo is, it's kind of interesting when, when you hire a um, physics grad as your, as your chief technology officer, he comes in and says, why would they use Monte Carlo for that? Like, have they ever heard of the different ways to calculate probability theories? Because and so, someone did it initially and it's stuck. And now exactly, it's Exactly, exactly right. So we did Lots of probability. Of, like, build a better engine for that than just Monte Carlo, but it accomplishes much the same result, just a little bit faster. It's a range of expectations over time. That's so you right. have your, here's the average number. Here is the range of expectations based on upside, downside probability and exactly. helps them understand that essentially you're going to land somewhere within that. So right. usually valuable. So you must love things like the fiduciary rule. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, we were very engaged with the whole fiduciary rule discussion and we continue to be so. I think that what the industry really needs, I, 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 my personal point of view is I would rather that we not take the tack of banning the sale of financial products, <laughs> but I'd rather that we create a huge amount of clarity between what firms are actually offering. Are you yeah. selling financial products or are you selling your advice? Yeah, you and can't I think wear both we, hats. Yeah. yeah, we can't wear both hats. Like we need to be really clear. I never go to a car dealership and expect that the sales guy is operating on my behalf. I don't have an expectation. They might even call him a sales advisor, right? But I know that a car dealer is not operating on my behalf. He's operating for the best commission that he can get. I, if I go, it should not be possible for me to hire somebody who calls themselves an advisor who's telling me that they're operating on my behalf, who's not. And I think that we've just got to create clarity between those two things. I, I've often said, I feel like that thousand page DOL fiduciary rule that, that we had in the US for a bit, could have really been boiled down to a, a one or two page rule with like a one page. It's almost like how we have truth in lending statements when you get a mortgage. Yes, yeah, the one a standard some... format to tell you what you're getting. Like we should do the same thing. And like, let's just tell the consumer, you're talking to a salesperson who sells financial products. Yep. They make a commission based on what they sell you. Make a good decision. The decision is yours. Or you're talking to a financial advisor and they're selling you their advice and they're not going to make any difference in money or fees based on what they recommend to you. Exactly. We, we need that kind of clarity in our industry. Yeah. I mean, well, that's, that's the problem with so many things in this world is that the legal jargon it describes, it tends to be hugely enormous. Just pick up a mutual yep. fund perspective altogether. Yep. And what needs to be boiled down to one page for a client to easily digest is just not going to happen in most cases. Right. So, I mean, and in, in the fiduciary world, you guys do very well because, you know, again, with that obligation to basically act in the client's best interest, risk assessment's got to be a big part of that. I mean, it I've has. had another risk assessment company on before and my question to them, and I'm going to ask you the same thing. You ever been asked to testify in court? Because I got to figure that at some point it's going to be, if it hasn't happened, it's going to happen in your future. As yeah, we, you know, I, 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 yeah, it, it, definitely so. And it's been interesting because we've talked to a lot of advisors and they say, and I'm talking about, you know, I, I feel like the advisors that we work with are some of the best people I know because they are 
basically dedicating their lives to helping their clients, to feeling and living the stress of their clients' lives and helping that client get to the other side. And it's through their work that incredible world-changing things are going to be funded through nonprofit giving and Mm -hmm. grandkids are going to college and people are retiring with dignity and certainty. And so I just think that what great advisors do is dramatically undervalued and underappreciated in our, in our, in our world. But when I talk to a lot of those advisors, some of the best advisors in our profession, they have been in the past worried that one bad apple client who's trying to kind of rewrite history will come in and make a ridiculous assertion that you put me into a portfolio that you should have known was too risky for me, that I couldn't handle. And the statement that I get from them today is, I don't worry about that anymore because the client is having to put some skin in the game by saying, this is who I am and this is what I can handle. And now I'm able to demonstrate them that alignment And that's putting us in a really level set relationship where the client has skin in the game on that question. That's really important. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the CYA attitude to it is is one thing, but the helping to create greater understanding and better outcomes through yes. through aligning portfolios to their actual tolerance is the is the big payoff, right? Sure. And I mean, I've seen the T three surveys on on what's being used, and unfortunately, I think like fifty percent say nothing, which is always shocking to right. me because like you know, people will sometimes say like, "Tell me about your competitors." I'm like, "Our competitor is nothing. Like our competitor yeah. is an Excel yeah. spreadsheet." Or a gut instinct. Yeah, you know? it's, it's apathy and, uh, and ignorance, unfortunately, is the, is the largest competitor you deal with in this space, which is unfortunate. And, and you'll great. laugh at this, but a lot of those advisors who we are, I think we're, we are winning the battle against nothing. Like we're, that's who we consider to be our competition. Like we are, we are actively attacking nothing as the category, right? And so what's really interesting is that a small percentage of those advisors who come aboard, probably the ones who kind of have their roots over in the old sales model, right? And they're, they're kind of learning how to become fiduciaries. Yep. But I'll tell you what I get once in a long while, and I, it's, it's maybe once a month. So this is probably 12 advisors a year, okay? So it's not a huge scale, but I always find it interesting. And they will call up and they will say, look, I just don't feel like the risk in this portfolio is as risky as risk allies is saying it is. And we'll always just like double check the data. Like maybe there's something in the data with a mutual fund or something like that. But the reality is, is 99 times out of 100, like we come back to that, we go, no, the data is right. Like we're not going to change the risk number to suit your feeling, right? And they're like, well, trust me, like I just don't feel like this portfolio is that risky. And our response to that is always, (laughs) trust your feelings is only for Jedi's. So like we we, we can't can't just go with that, right? We got to go. You just hit such an important like issue right there. And it's the, the need for the industry to move well beyond rules of thumb, feelings, gut emotions, all this nonsense to actual quantifiable, academically tested, you know, proven cases where we are literally stress testing and understanding. We're not making recommendations without some sort of quantifiable background within reason that explains it. It's the entire, I have a feeling. Well, I have lots of feelings throughout the day. I'm hungry right now because it's around noon. Okay. That, and not only that, that's the other thing is too, like stop to think about how, how ridiculous that is because if you had a stressful day, if you're sleepy, that impacts how you feel about the entire thing. I mean, there's, there's even case studies that have been done that show that judges are more likely to give lenient sentences after they've eaten lunch, right? Like if you're to ever on for parole, lunch. you better hope that your case comes up right after lunch. Cause yeah, that that's, it. that's it. That's it. Because if it's at four o'clock, you're going back in. Four o'clock or eleven thirty, you're you're toast. You're, you're toast. Yeah, it's just like so, just and shame for And you said the word wives' tales. That's another thing that kind of infects our industry. I, you know, how about this one? Invest your age in bonds. Oh God, I knew you were going there. I knew you were going there. <laughs> You know what is the saddest thing? Okay, so there's a saddest thing. There was a paper presented at the FBA conference uh, about a couple, three years ago. Yeah. And it was a study done out of Georgia. And it was basically asking advisors to, like, it was like, here's like 10 different scenarios. What would you recommend as, the, as a target allocation for each of them, yep. right? There was n- n- next to no consistency or rationality. In fact, one of the questions was the same scenario separated by one question. So say question three was the same as question five. Yeah. And there wasn't even consistency amongst the advisors in those two recommendations. And it gets better. <laughs> you know what the, mo- the model of best fit was 100 minus your age. To which yeah. I am sitting there in that session, and you could, I swear to God, you could hear my head slap, my face palm must have echoed <laughs> off the walls because I hit so hard. And I just, you know, it's one of these things where it's like, we cannot, who in their right mind thinks that this is acceptable? So we actually have some interesting data about how wrong that idea is. 
Okay. Which was wrong. So we, we, we had some academics come in and kind of vet all the methodology and, and kind of you know, do some research on that and dig into a lot of the data. And one of the really interesting things that they found in the data, this was led by, uh, by the way, Dr. Noah Smith, who is a um, really uh, fascinating guy who was um, in behavioral economics, has been in behavioral economics for a long time. Fascinating guy. And he led this team of academics to kind of dig into this. Well, one of the things they found in the data I thought was fascinating. So they took all the risk tolerance data that we'd ever collected from millions of clients, right? And they looked at investors' ages and they said, okay, investors age 20 to 29, okay? 52% of them didn't fit the stereotype of being aggressive, okay? So what that means is, if you think about it, is that like the stereotype is kind of mostly right, because 48%, almost half of that age bracket is aggressive. And that's how we typically stereotype what those investors. What was gender breakdown on that? <laughs> we have done gender breakdowns, by the way, and we have not found the typical thing where everybody thinks women are, less, are, are more conservative. Like, we actually found yeah. that women had an equally high propensity to be, you know, risk tolerant. Interesting. That, I figured the younger yeah. men would be, more, would be more likely. But yeah. here's the thing about that exact statement, though, that, that always drives me nuts about conventional thinking in the business. Yeah. Is, oh, yeah, you are young. You should have, you have this long time horizon. Go ahead and invest with risk. Really, I'm pretty sure these people want to buy homes, cars, get married, have families. Like, their timeline for their money is not long run. It's not. Well, and 52% of them... Yeah. We're spread across the rest of the investing spectrum, all the way from moderately aggressive to conservative, right? Yeah. And what's fascinating is that it was flipped for investors age 70 to 79, okay? 53% of them didn't fit the stereotype of being conservative. And they were yeah. equally kind of spread across the rest. The other 53% yeah. were spread across the rest of the investing spectrum. So we've had advisors come in and say, I had this one, I had one advisor, George, this is in 2013. And he said, I basically just lost a client today and won them back. And I said, interesting, like, tell me more. And he says, the guy came in, I was pretty sure he was making all the kind of the noises about leaving. And so he comes in for a meeting with me. He's been a client forever. And he says, yeah, George, I'm going to leave. Like my son has been doing better than I have. My friend has been doing better than I have, blah, blah, blah. Right. And George, oh, my like, friends bought some dividend paying stocks and therefore yeah. they're doing awesome. I get that all the well, time. And, and yeah. So George says, well, this is really, it's a bummer. Like I've loved having you as a client. Like I just started using this risk of thing. Like, do you mind if we go through, I'm just morbidly curious, like what your risk number is. So they go through the process. This guy is 75 years old and he comes out as a risk 72. Okay. Okay. And George is like fascinating. He's like, I always knew that you were more aggressive than any of my clients who are 75 years old, okay? But I've got all my other 75-year-old clients basically invested like a risk 35. And so I made you a risk 45. You're a risk 72. So he caught and, me. And he he said, it, to the it clicked for him. It clicked for him. He said, you know, this guy is a retired state of California employee. And if there's one thing we know about the state of California, it's that they will bankrupt the state before they don't pay the pensions. Pensions, yeah. Okay. So he, this money is about whether or not he and his wife are going to be able to buy the vacation home. Yeah. It's not about, so he needs it to grow. And that's what he's focused on. So he literally says, well, look, I feel bad that we haven't figured this out before, but like, let me show you my risk 75 portfolio and pulls that out and shows it to him. And the guy's like, you can do this for me, George. He goes, absolutely. He goes, great. You're hired again. So it's, <laughs> it's fascinating what happens when we anchor clients yeah. to stereotypes and I think that what we're trying to do is, is like quantify this for advisors so they can start anchoring clients to themselves. Yeah, it's such a problem. Uh, it's amazing how just our own preconceived notions of what's good for us filter through to everybody else. And that's just not the job. Well, and I love that point too, because we had another advisor who joined who said, you know, I did the risk number for myself and it came out as a 51. He said, and then I put my own portfolio in and it came out as a 52. And I'm like, all right, like I got it going on. I know what I'm doing here, right? He goes, so I plugged in all my client portfolios. They ranged from 40 to 60. He said, then I started getting risk numbers back from clients for their next reviews. And they ranged from the 20s to the 80s. And it didn't take very long for me to spot the pattern. I was really good at figuring out who was more conservative than me and who was more aggressive than me but I was anchoring all of them to me. You. Yeah. And so like, I now understood why my conservative clients still felt scared 
And my aggressive clients still felt frustrated because I was anchoring them to me. So today I'm anchoring them to them. And my conservative clients feel really comfortable and my aggressive clients feel really happy. Yeah, it's so interesting because too often I hear things like said, like, okay, like start with a default in your mind of like 60, 40. I'm like, wait a minute, no, the default is zero. (laughs) The default, (laughs) I do nothing. The the, the next thing is, what do I need and what can I stomach are the two determinant factors behind what I actually do. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. Good. So yeah. basically, let's. Uh, we talked about a lot of heavy things. Let's go back to the product. So sure. talk about the experience, right? Okay. So I basically decide that I'm going to use this with my client. What does that experience look? Like? Well, you know, that is one of the I think the really important parts of our DNA that we kind of built into the company at the beginning is we just said, look, the software and the systems and the tools that we use in this profession are just bad. Like they're just bad user experiences and they've got really bad design. And I feel like we can do better. So we kind of built design into our core DNA from day one. Uh, You know, and I think that from my perspective, it's critically important to do that because our ethos has been, we want the technology to actually fade into the background so that the brilliance of the advisor's work shines through. Far too many times I see technology being used by advisors for technology's sake. There's that hysterical ad campaign that uh, Schwab is running, kind of making fun of advisors, but it's got like a, a, an Alexa, but they call it, uh, I can't remember what they, what they call it in the ad, but it's kind of like the advisor has put an Alexa on the table just to try to show that they're a high-tech advisor, right? And th- that's, that's the essence of technology for the sake of technology. Yeah. Our view is the technology needs to kind of fade into the background, let the brilliance of the advisor's work shine through. So we really try to put the advisor front and center there. But it's a big part of that is building incredible design into everything that we do so that it's a really great experience for the advisor to swivel their screen around and take the client through something that's deeply understandable. And I, I feel like what we sometimes replace are the 30-page bound portfolio reports that will tell your client there are multiple, their standard deviation, and a host of other statistics that none of them understand. Exactly, because they all, they all know what R squared means, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. So overall, it's, uh, and not only that, you guys, of course, you know, you've done things like data aggregation. You can suck in someone's portfolio, right? So making it nice and easy. Uh, and I mean, you seem to have quite the plethora of reports here. I mean, you do the, the standard risk score. Uh, yep. You do some scenario planning, some kind of rudimentary financial planning statistics, client dashboards you provide as well. So you kind of really built the whole suite there. And it looks like you, like all companies in the States, like to integrate with lots of different companies. So For sure. Yeah, I I, I think that (laughs) we built a lot of pieces. I mean, I will tell you, we, we do not consider ourselves a financial planning company. There's a bunch of great financial planning providers who do a great job. And we just feel like that's a solved problem in a lot of ways. So we partner with and integrate with a lot of those great products. We're not building a CRM for advisors. We're not building portfolio management and accounting and those kinds of things. We really feel like we're at our best when we focus. It's one of our core values as a company. We say we want to focus on doing a small number of things really, really well so we can make a deep impact on the advisors that we serve and not try to boil the ocean. Yeah, uh, and too often. I mean, the old stu- the old school way was to you know they wanted the one what I call the Tolkien solution. They want yeah. the uh, the one ring to rule them all. So the one software that will do everything. Unfortunately, it's all going to be mediocre at best. Whereas I love that, the world that's exactly right. I we really feel like if we followed that strategy, not trying to throw shade at anybody else, but if we followed that strategy, we would be mediocre at everything and not particularly good at any one thing. So and our focus world of they- is on on building a lot of those really deep, rich integrations yeah. with other tools, so that advisors can kind of build a best of breed solution that that allows them to differentiate their business. And that's the thing is, there's no need to kind of try to build it all when you can have a bunch yeah. of very highly niche, specialized offerings that are going to be best in class. Yep. And advisors are finicky and picky people, right? Like there's certain again, we talked about preferences, individual preferences, and whatnot. But yep. even when it comes to software, it's the same thing. So trying to convince someone, you know, in the U.S. to move from red tail to juncture, if it's that's the better value <laughs> proposition, good luck to you. Best of luck. Uh, right. So sure. before we finish up, I got uh, three questions I ask everybody at the end of it. So make you think. First of all, if you had one wish for something you could change in the industry, your company, or whatever it might be, what would that be? It's a great question. I would say that we embrace in this profession that there's a selling model and there's a fiduciary advice model, mm-hmm. and that both are okay. 
I feel like we're a bit at loggerheads in this industry and everybody who's on the fiduciary advice side kind of says like, it's like butting heads constantly. And I'm just like, you know what? I think both models are fine, but we've got to be clear with clients about what they need. And I I, I genuinely think that the fiduciary advice model is, is superior from my perspective in terms of its ability to deliver really great outcomes for clients. But I understand that there are a lot of clients who will not be able to, at least the way that technology is scaled right now, at least the way that advisor practices scale, it's really tough for some people to get access to the advice that they need. I feel like it's our job as a technology company, and this is a big part of our long-term vision, to try to help advisors democratize access to advice. And to try to make the technology so great and so automated that advisors can really handle more clients and increase the quality of their advice simultaneously. So that that would be my big wish, that we're able to really expand the fiduciary advice model, but it's by choice, not by regulation. Excellent. Well, I hope one day that conversation starts happening in my country. (laughs) You guys, shame us into it, please. The next question, what are the biggest challenges you encountered in in starting and running this company? Oh, man, so many. But I mean, probably the biggest one had to be when we almost, you know, ran out of cash and failed. So we started the company in 2011 and really just spent the first year building core technology. And our strategy was we didn't think that great financial advisors were going to road test brand new risk technology on their clients. So we said, we've got to validate this some way. So what we did is we picked, we didn't want to be a robo advisor. Like we didn't think that was a good business model. So we're like, what we're going to do is we're going to ship a free version of this technology for like the $25,000 E-Trade guy who doesn't have access to advice. And we're going to get a bunch of, you know, the internet makes distribution really, really free and cheap. Okay. And so we're going to ship a free version of the tech for that kind of investor, self-directed investor, and we're going to validate the technology that way. So 2012 was our year of successful failure because the success was we got great PR, NPR, New York Times, Barron's. We had users come in and build $2 billion in portfolios on, the, on that you know, old free version of the product and average account size, $27,000. We kind of nailed our use case. The, you know, the users loved it. They were coming in and figuring out how to rebalance their accounts to fit their risk number. And then, you know, ostensibly going over and doing the trades in E-Trade or TD yeah. or whatever. And so that was all great. The failure part was that our strategy for monetizing that was to license the tech to one of the big discount brokers. And we're like, well, that's going to bring in a 10, 12 million bucks a year or something like that. That's going to fund our work on the advisor product. Okay. Well, that was a failure. Like in hindsight, I don't think we could have gotten where we are today without living through 2012. But in hindsight, there were only five prospective customers on the face of planet earth. And in short order, like basically four were eliminated for how they like to partner or their financial situation at the time. Like one of those was like about to go into bankruptcy. They ended up avoiding bankruptcy, but lost their CEO. Like they couldn't get the deal done. We actually kind of got the deal with one of them. And then it kind of fell apart on a technical level. It was kind of big company speak for go away, come back and talk to us in four to six quarters, which basically big company speak means never. And when they told us that, like that was kind of the end of 2012. And we had like three months of money in the bank. And we're, we're like, I remember like flying back home from that meeting where that deal fell apart. And I somewhere I've still got the page in my notebook that I wrote what I call the Apollo 13 question, right? Where Gene Kranz is trying to get the astronauts back safely to Earth. And he says, what do we have on the ship that's good? And all I could write was great core technology in the risk number. And $2 billion worth of validation from investors. And so I came back to the team and just said, look, if we're going to go down, like, let's go down swinging. Let's rebuild the product for advisors. And our $2 billion of validation isn't enough to make it go. And there was a lot of smoke before there was fire, but within a couple of months, we rolled the product out of beta and it just took off like a rocket. And like I said, we had four people in the company at the beginning of 2013. And end of that year, we had 10. The next year, it was 25. The next year, uh, I think it was like 60 and then 90 and now 200. And so it's been a wild ride, but we're just incredibly thrilled and, and privileged to be able to serve such incredible financial advisors across the, you know, the country. Uh, I often joke that uh, self-employment is the most manic depressive thing you'll ever do to yourself. So <laughs> uh, you've definitely seen the hills and valleys of that one, good sir. There's a couple of times that I've said it's always darkest before the dawn. Yeah. 
<laughs> or sometimes just the train about to hit you. Right. So <laughs> the last question I ask is what energizes you to keep doing what you're doing? What gets you out of bed every morning? What is it that really lights a fire under your butt to keep your mission? That's out? an easy question for me. It's that mission, right? I mean, empowering the world to invest fearlessly. And we are so thrilled to work with 20,000 advisors who have delivered over 5 million clients, their risk number. And I look at that and I go, 5 million, what an incredible number. And yet there's 7 billion people in the world. So we've yeah. got our work cut out for us. I, I tell the team we're building a 100-year company. We've got 92 years to go. And that's a lot of work to get to 7 billion people. So empowering the world to invest fearlessly is what gets us all out of bed in the morning and it gets us excited to come to work. And we're well on our way to achieving that vision. Fantastic. Well, great work and keep it up. Thank and, you. Uh, I wish you nothing but uh, ongoing success. So thank you very much for taking the time today. Thank you, sir. So that was my interview with Aaron Klein of Riskalyze. I hope you enjoyed that. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. And until next time, I'm Jason Pereira. Take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.